it. You know it at once, don't you? It, it, it just feels off. Something is out of whack. Sometimes the composer puts in wrong notes on purpose to create a sense of unrest or discord, but only the right notes struck together create harmony. The beautiful flute of music we heard, the way the musical notes are sequenced and spaced and flow together is built into mathematics and built into the fabric of the universe. In fact, music holds the universe I don't pretend to understand how that works, <laughs> but it does. When you musicians play in harmony, you're also playing in mathematical harmony. That is why mathematics works. And you're playing in harmony with the entire universe. And that includes heaven. That includes where we go when we are translated. When Tom sent me word a few days ago, he texted me, Eric Carla is with the angels now. Carla has been translated into a better language and is playing in perfect harmony with the angels. In this world, like every single one of us, Carla now and then hit a wrong note. We all get wrong notes now and then. But now she is in perfect harmony, playing to perfection in unison with the universe. And yet, that might be comforting to think about, but there is still grief for those who are left behind. You who are her family and friends will miss her so much Feel her loss so sorely. You may feel anger at the terrible disease that is cancer. And you should. Carla bravely faced it, but it was not easy, and you should be angry that she had to suffer that. You may feel angry that she has been separated from you so soon. She might have had another decade or two to share in your lives. And your anger is justified. Don't ever feel bad for feeling angry about loss. That too is part of grief and the way you come to terms with those losses. But there's something else we all should be open to and aware of. Carla is close. She is close. You may not be able to physically touch her, but that is only because these pathetic shells that we call our bodies are so limited. Someday we will shed them too, every one of us, and be released into that larger place where Carla is. <coughs> I want to share with you briefly, I hope it's not an imposition, but something that happened after my other mother died. I write, I write novels and my mother was a nurse and she'd always been my main medical resource when I was writing. And after she died, I began writing a novel about the famous English writer Emily Bronte, who died young of tuberculosis. My mother's job as a public health nurse in the 1960s was treating tuberculosis patients. And I knew nothing about tuberculosis, and my mother was no longer around to ask questions of. Then came the first Mother's Day without her. And I will warn you, Whitney, and Greg, and Megan, Mother's Day will never be the same for you again. And the first Mother's Day without Carla will be especially hard. When carnations are given out after church service, where you once received a red carnation, you will now receive a white one. So that Mother's Day, I sadly took my first white carnation and wandered over to Taylor Brooks, which is for my after church habit time. For some reason, I didn't know why then. Well, I didn't know why now, but then I didn't know why. I used to go straight to the fiction section. Instead, I went to 
that part of the store books on science for shelf. And I never read books on science, but somehow I found myself in that section of the store, and I immediately noticed a book that it was out of place, it had been set, askew, and was about to fall off the shelf. And I picked it up to put it back in its place, and when I did, I saw the title. It was The White Plague. And the subtitle said it's the reprint of a classic study of tuberculosis. And I saw that not only would I find answers to my questions about tuberculosis, there was even an entire chapter about the plague rocking of her illness. And I knew in that moment, that electric moment, that my mom was there right beside me, right with me. On Mother's Day, my mother had given me a present. And I prayed with all my heart that you all experience those moments when you feel Carla close. You won't know when it will be. It won't be every moment because you will be going about your lives. And Carla will be occupied too. She has a whole vast, infinite heaven and universe to explore and experience. But I hope you will feel her presence from time to time. Tom, it may be sitting out on your back towards watching the Cardinals. Whitney and Greg and Megan, it may be when a piece of music brings Carla vividly present to you, or a memory from your childhood, or a piece of advice she gave you. Owen and Gabriel, it may be when you're running track or swimming and meet and you feel her cheering her, cheering you on. I don't know when it'll be, but I pray you'll have those moments of recognition. Because Carla is apart from you, but she is not absent. She's in a different place now, but not estranged. She's not dead, but alive in Christ Jesus, who conquered death for her and all of us. She is now Carla at her most essential. Essential for her. And she's in a larger place than we are here. She's in so much a larger place, more than we can even imagine with these confined little brains of ours. One short sleep past, we wake eternally. And death shall be no more, death thou shalt not.
When Greg was getting married to Megan, <clears throat> I remember Carla in my bedroom trying on dresses, trying to find just the right one. Truth be told, it didn't matter which one she chose because her beaming pride outshone all of those dresses. Carla welcomed Owen and Megan into her family, and when Gabriel came along, her heart swelled two sizes. Carla was beaming when you were ordained, Greg. She was so proud of your hard work, your gentle heart, and your calm. Whitney, you are so much like your mom. Your smile lights up the room like hers did. You followed successfully in her footsteps in so many ways as a great mom, an amazing friend, and a hard worker, and she was so proud of you. You are kind, and you have the gift of really caring about others. You can also talk about anything, just like Carla. And Ethan, with his gorgeous blue eyes, is taking after Carla and you, especially with his gift of gap. <laughs> to Carla's grandchildren, your Gabby loved you so much more than life. We all heard about your successes, your challenges, your kind hearts, and your smarts. We heard about adventures, the big dig, Starbucks runs, and games, and tricks, and treats. Keep her and the incredible gift that she gave you through how much she loved you with you forever. Tom, what can I say about you, Tom? We were instantly friends when we first met. We're both nurses. My husband knew Tom already from CAMC. And Carla, because Carla was my hairdresser. One of the most important people in my life. <laughs> we four were restaurant buddies, restaurant week buddies, and did I mention Sitar of India? Tom loved Carla with all of his heart, and she him. As a fellow nurse, I know that Tom took Carla's illness even harder than the rest of us. You see, as nurses, we save people. We like to be in control, and Tom, you know that's true, right? <laughs> we never give up. We make people better. I know that the last year and a half has tested you so. In the end, all of the nurses and love in the world couldn't save Carla. There was very little control to be had. And at some point, too, Tom, you and your family had to decide to give up, or better say, to let go. But remember what I said that nurses do? We save people, we like to be in control, we don't give up, and we make people better. Tom, you were able to do the most important thing on this list. You made her better. You cruised, you laughed, you enjoyed life together, even after Carla's illness. And you made her better by making that oh-so-difficult decision to let her go to be with God, surrounded by her family, her friends, and even her cats. Always remember that, Tom. You were the nurse, her special nurse, who did that for her. I can't mention every family member here, but Tom's girls and their families, and Carla's sisters, and her special cousins, Twilight and Phil, and many others held a special place in her heart. The legacy Carla leaves within her family is a treasure that will be cherished for generations to come. I said earlier that Carla's friends were friends for life, but they also represented every part of her life. Carla never went any place where she didn't make a friend. Stephanie, her work buddy extraordinaire who became chosen family, Angela, Sue, April, Belinda, constant visitors and helpers, her band friends, you all are so amazing. From the special concert on the front lawn when she came home from the hospital last year, to birthday celebrations and elves at your holiday concerts, you made her life fun and let her indulge her lifelong love of music. Sue, Penny, Gretchen, and Steve, it was like it was meant to be that you were there with Tom when Carla took her last breath. Carla's book club, her Weight Watchers buddies, her clients, her yoga pals, Folks she met when she and Tom were cruising, all friends for life. How all of our lives have been intersected is amazing, and at the center is Carla. I was blessed to know her, and blessed to know so many of you because of her. We are all so blessed. My family is Jewish. 
In Judaism, there's a concept called tikkun olam, or repairing the world. It is one of the most important things in our lives, making the world a better place. Carla understood this deeply, dedicating herself to acts of kindness and service, not only bettering the lives of all of us in her community, but also contributing to making the world better. I mentioned Carla's band friends. One day she told me she'd been thinking about the wisdom of so many of the band members and how their stories needed to be told so that we can all learn from them. Carla took on a project with Tom to capture those stories and interviewed and shared all of those <coughs> stories with the world through Facebook. What an amazing legacy. Carla's most recent acts of kindness were extended to other patients at the CAMC Cancer Center, where while fighting her fight, she volunteered. The music of flutes floating through the lobby brought joy to so many. This was just one act of kindness and so many throughout her life, repairing the world. So today as we bid farewell to our dear Carla, let us hold tight to the memories, to the love shared, and to her wisdom and spirit. Let us remember the love, the laughter, and the precious moments we share together. May we continue to feel Carla's presence in our lives, guiding us, inspiring us, and reminding us of the beauty and the fragility of life. May we always think about and emulate Carla's gentle spirit. As we leave here today, let us go forth with Carla's name in our hearts, honoring her memory through our actions and through the way that we live our lives. In Jewish tradition, we often say, may her memory be for a blessing. When we say this, the blessing that we're implying is that it's up to those who bear the memory of the person who passed away to keep their goodness alive. By remembering them and their good works and good deeds, speaking their name and carrying on their legacy, they live on in our hearts and in our minds. Indeed, the memory of Carla is a blessing, a source of light and inspiration for us all. May her memory be a blessing to each of us who love her for all the days of our lives. This is a letter written by Carla's cousin, Twyla Campbell Bishop. When I last saw her, Carla was doing so well. An entire year had passed since her diagnosis. That year was a gift. She asked if I wanted to speak at her funeral. I hesitated because my emotions were so conflicted. Honestly, I just didn't want to think of her dying. And I truly thought she had more time. That's the great lie we tell ourselves, that we have more time. Intellectually, we know and understand that we have no control over time and circumstance, but we turn our backs on that truth, and our heart tries to believe that we have more time. I wanted to hide from the truth of how ill she was. It was easy to do because she hid it well. She kept the illness at bay as long as she could, and she fought the brave fight. Before she passed, I asked Tom to read my words to Carla. I wanted her to know what I would say in her service. My eulogy is, in the simplest of forms, a love letter to her. I would like to share them with you today, because I know that each of you shares my sorrow, and we are walking through this group together. What do you say to a loved one who's dying? The only thing to say is, I love you. And we've said that to each other so many times over our lifetime. She knew I loved her dearly, and I knew she loved me. I know that there is nothing that I can say to Tom, Whitney, Greg, or any of you that will bring comfort, because the loss is just too great. But please know I share your grief. I hope my words will embrace you and let you know that you're not alone. Funerals are for those of us left behind. It is a short pause in our life activities to absorb that great loss that we have experienced 
and to share memories. A street artist named Banksy once said, they say you die twice. One time when you stop breathing, and the second time, a bit later on, when somebody says your name for the last time. Look around. We are the keepers of Carla's memories. So many of us loved her, and her memory will remain for another lifetime. I will carry Carla's memory throughout my life, and I will never be in West Virginia without feeling her spirit accompanying me. I will miss her so much. West Virginia holds a special place in my heart, the mountains, the mist, and Carla. West Virginia will not be the same to me without her. I think it's natural when someone we love dies young to despair about all of life's experiences that they will miss. But then it occurred to me that this thinking is an earthbound way of seeing things. I then asked her this. You are on the precipice between this world and the one beyond. Have you glimpsed heaven yet? Have you seen your dad and your mom, our grandparents, my folks? Have they arrived and shown you all the wonders that await you? Are you excited for those of us left behind to see and experience these things for ourselves? There was no answer. Only the tight squeeze she held on to Tom's hand. Maybe that was the answer. I had almost asked if she was sad because we couldn't see what she experienced. But I realized there is no sadness where she was going. Sadness, pain, and grief are experiences from which she has been freed. I believe that she is excited for us to see and experience the afterlife. So why was it important to tell her that I loved her before she left? Maybe because in the end, love is the only permanent thing. Love isn't impacted by life or death. There is no beginning to love and there is no end. It is all encompassing. I believe that God is love. When all else fails, there is love. Carla hasn't ceased to exist. Death is not the end. But she is missing from us. Or maybe we are missing from her. I will look for her in my dreams. I know she will visit me. She will visit all of us, and I can only hope that we are aware of her spirit's presence when she checks in on us. I will look for her in the mountain breeze that stirs the trees at the top of Eve's hill. I will look for her sign. What should be the sign between us that tells me she is near? The day my mom passed away, we were on the road making our way to her town. I prayed and asked for a butterfly as a sign from her. We've also been taught that God will answer our prayers and that we should have faith. Ten minutes later, we pulled off the road at a rest area so that the dogs could stretch their legs. I saw a butterfly, and then another one, and another. Then I saw a sign in the shape of a large butterfly. Mom still sends me butterflies. Once, while camping, one landed on my finger while I was talking to my two daughters. It hung around all three of us for almost 20 minutes before going on its way. My brother, who passed away 12 years ago, randomly knocks photos off walls. My dad calls my name in my sleep and wakes me up. You don't have to believe me. It's enough that I believe it. I believe in miracles. I suspect Carla will play music for me and wake me from my sleep. I will listen for it. I will be you too. I weep for me. I weep for Tom and Whitney, Greg, and especially for her grandsons, Gabriel, Ethan, and Owen. They deserve a lifetime of getting to know her, and I wish they had it. I'm glad they have Tom. I'm sure he will help to keep their memories of her sharp as will their parents. They say that memories are sharpened by the trek through the brain as we retrieve them again and again. The mental trek carves a trail, like a trail through the woods. The more often we tread to the same place, the stronger the trail. I know the memories may be painful to you now, but it's so important that you speak of her often, especially with the children. Remind them of the special times they spend with her. Remind them of her little sayings. Speak of her and let them laugh and remember vividly so that the trail is strong and will last their lifetimes. 
give them stories to pass on to their children. In closing, I know you will join me in asking Carla to fly high and come back to get us when the desire turning crossover. I'll be looking for her, and I know you will too. Carla, if you're listening, remember that I love you. I miss you. I miss the me that I am when I am with you. Fly high until we meet again. Carla Paul Mitchell. Some of us touch it palpably. 
And yet all of us at some level in this room, of whatever tradition we are, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Christian of every stripe, those of no faith, those whose faith is known to the Holy One alone, we can sense that love that is present even amidst our grief. And that is love, true love, that brings us together in this room today and supports us on our journey and on our painful and ongoing earthly pilgrimage on good days and bad days. On days when we feel like we can fight and days when we can't and the ROUSs are about to get us. And it is that love that will continue through our own life and in all that marvelous harmonic life in the next. That's what we call eternal life and it is not bound by time. It is not the time on our watches or devices, but it is a harmony of the spheres that even we participate in our love in this room now. And so I invite you to stand. And in the words of the bulletin, and in the assurance of eternal life given in baptism, I invite you to say with me the words of the Apostles' Creed as we say, I believe in God, the Father Eternal life.